We did a working group last call on version 13. Uh, that was a few weeks ago. Um, we got a lot of feedback on that. Several comments ranging from editorial um, changes to uh, also some normative changes that were proposed. Um, but yeah, overall, no big changes. Um, after the working group last call, we in particular changed the following things. Uh, so regarding the editorial changes, the attacker model and the recommendation sections uh, switched places. So recommendations is now the section two after the introduction, so that um, in particular developers who just want to read how to implement auth securely can just go to the first section after the introduction and, and start reading. Da Daniel, Stop. Daniel we, we lost the sharing. Oh, I said. Mm -hmm. I don't see, I don't see it. Uh, do you guys see the sharing? Oh, here it is. It stopped for some reason, but I didn't notice it. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, so I take a model and recommendation switch places uh, so that the recommendations come first. There were various small improvements, uh, mainly clarifications, um, better definitions, in particular regarding cross-site request forgery uh, in the context of war and what an open redirector is. Um, we expanded on some of the attack details and examples um, to re remove some ambiguities that were still in there. And I restructured the, the so in the, in the um, um, last section, we had a lot of discussions on how to prevent some attacks. And some of these discussions were rather outdated. Um, and I also restructured some of them um, to make them easier to read. Um, and we got about a dozen or so uh, emails about that a reference is wrong, and we fixed that as well, and hopefully. For the normative changes, the interesting stuff. Um, before uh, this version, we had uh, clients should not, uh, so this, this should read, should avoid forwarding. Um, uh, users to arbitrary URLs. Otherwise, they are advised to implement countermeasures against open redirection. So that was really fuzzy. Um, and uh, the newer wording is now clients must not expose open redirectors, where also a definition of an open redirector is given. Um, so this was from a should avoid some alternative to must not expose um, open redirectors. Next one is regarding Pixie. We had an AS should provide a way to detect their support for Pixie. Um, and we always say that they should either publish, uh, so they should either, either use AS metadata or they provide a deployment specific way to ensure and determine the Pixie support by the authorization server. Um, we made that a must um, because knowing whether a server supports Pixie or not is really important uh, because you can then rely on Pixie um, also for example, for cross-site request for protection. And regarding the implicit grant, um, we didn't change too much actually, but we changed how we worded it. Um, before we wrote, clients should not use the implicit grant unless access tokens, so I'm, this is a short version, I will have the long version on the slide in a minute. Clients should not use implicit grant unless access tokens are sender constrained and access token injection is prevented. Um, now we have clients should not use implicit unless access token injection is prevented and token leakage vectors um, that were described beforehand are mitigated. Sorry, if, if you're not speaking, can you please go mute? There is a background noise there. Can you please go mute? <laughs> Could you please mute? Thank you. 
Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and in both versions, we always said um, clients should instead use code and clients should use sender constraining. Uh, so this go goes back mainly to a proposal by Brian. Um, here's the full wording. Uh, I leave that here uh, uh, for you to read uh, for a minute. This was also discussed on the list. Um, yeah. So this is also the, the I, I think, one of the biggest changes that we had. Um, apart from that, there was not too much that was changed since the, uh, or after the working group last call. So what this is saying is that uh, like, uh, mitigation methods might be picked. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, can can you please state your name first? Oh, sure. Sorry, this is Jared Jennings. Okay. Go ahead, Jared. So what you're saying here is like a injection mitigation might be Pixie or something like that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So so Pixie would be the, the usual access token injection prevention, yeah. So it, am I read is this Annabelle Backman Amazon? Am I reading this correctly that we're we're recommending mutual TLS just across the board without any qualification on that? Um, so we recommend using sender constraining and we say that MTLS is recommended for that purpose. Okay. I mean there's there's been a a lot of conversation, you know, in past meetings and and on the list about the, you know, the, the fact that that mutual TLS is not applicable or not feasible in all uh, deployments. So making it recommended here seems pretty strong. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm 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 not terribly comfortable with with us telling people they should all everyone should go out and implement mutual TLS like that's that's a complicated thing to deploy for a lot of cases like if we if if we really think sender constraining is 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 necessary i think the working group needs to invest more time in in making sure that we have viable sender constraining mechanisms uh, you know, and DPOP is a good step towards that for for certain environments as well. Um, but again, it doesn't doesn't cover the the general case. So I would I would like to see the working group do some do more work here. So this is just an um, one. I'm not sure what we're doing for queue management. So if I'm stepping over, please just tell me. No, um, no, feel feel free. This is just open discussion. Free for all. Nice. Um, so yeah, I'm, I understand, um, and I'm sympathetic to what Annabelle is just saying in terms of this being a normative recommended here. Um, I think what we're really saying is that the recommendation is to use, um, things that, um, prevent token replay and an instance of that, that we actually have an RFC and implementations and deployments for is uh, mutual TLS. So instead of a normative recommended here, uh, perhaps this language could be instead worded uh, towards an example like it was previously. I think I would be fine with that. Yeah, and I think that's a valid point. Yeah, I mean, e even the, the the should on on sender constrained access tokens, considering we don't have solid 
general case solutions for that makes makes me me nervous that people are going to go off and and try and build their own custom things that are you know going to be interoperable and and may not even work uh cuz you know people are trying to roll things themselves um yeah. so, so I, 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 I just to follow that super quick while i uh while i think that people will read this uh requirement and go build their own thing i think they're going to do that regardless and i personally see this as a bit of a wake up motivation for the working group to get better general purpose interoperable solutions in place um Torsten speaking i i fully agree with justin i mean you need to consider how we can how we came the, where we are um this should send the constraining is a result of merely one year of analysis how we could cope with uh, leakage and uh, replay of access tokens. And we discussed audience restriction and additional metadata and heck of other methods. And in the end, the working group, I think it's two years ago, uh, came to the conclusion center constraining seems to be the most viable option, even though we didn't have mechanisms at that time. Now, luckily we have MTLS, but basically I think that's the direction we are talking about. And it's not a it's not a normative must, right? It's a recommendation to consider sender constraining. And yes, we don't have mechanisms, interoperable mechanisms for all the use cases yet, but I hope we will be working on that. Yeah, to be clear, I'm not I'm not against the direction of sender constraining. I mean, I absolutely agree that's something we need to be uh, uh, pushing. Um, my concern is is us making effectively a normative. I, it's it's a should, but I mean, shoulds are you know do this unless you've got a really good reason. You know, usually you know when I see a should, I expect that to be. If you're not doing it, it's because you're doing some edge case kind of scenario. Uh, whereas that's that's very much not the case here for uh, situations where people would be unable to do sender constraining. So um, I guess I, I, I like Justin's idea of this being a wake up call to the working group or a, a motivating factor, but I do worry about us recommending things that we don't have standard mechanisms for. Um, Torsten again, I think what we could do is um, we could explicitly spell out if, if you, I mean, just, just out of the top of my head, if you are worried about leakage and replay, you send the constraining. If you aren't, you don't need to. Yeah. I mean, that, that, I, I, I'm <laughs> kind of walking the line here. That almost feels like it's weakening it, weakening it too much. Um, I don't know what the right answer is here. Um, I guess I just want to, I guess, you know, let's, I mean, let's honestly, people think about this a little bit more, but um, yeah, I, that, that, I don't have anything more to say on it. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, 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 to convey that. Um, you're making uh, really viable arguments, and I think there are use cases where I, I, I also will not use center constraining. Uh, what we have learned um, OAuth is used in scenarios much more than every scenarios than in the, in the past. So I'm, I'm also not quite sure what the right uh, wording here is, but that's that's the result of three years' work. So I, I think the shoot is okay. It's a message. It's not a hill that I'd die on. Um, and again, with uh, to echo Justin's sentiment, hopefully this, if nothing else, will, will motivate the working group to to do to continue the work it's doing here and 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 do some more there. So, so just for me to understand the conclusion of this discussion, or uh, Annabel, will you? Do, do you have a text in mind that you could suggest, or is it something that uh, not suggest? not off the top of my head? I'll let me I'll I'll think about it some more, and if if I come up with something, you know, in the next you know today or so, I'll 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 post it on the list. Um, I think we did talk a little bit about loosening or relaxing the text around mutual TLS. Um, I think ju I, I want to say Justin had a suggestion there, uh, but I, I might. That was pretty clear. Just don't use normative language to recommend it, but we could show it as an example, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
something like one such mechanism is RFC 8705. Literally the text that it had before this change, it's on the left side of the screen right now. But I mean, not mentioning token, rest in peace. Well, the text on the screen specifically talks about TLS based, the, the old text says, you know, should use TLS based methods, uh, da, 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 such as token binding or yeah, mutual that, TLS. That, so that's, I wouldn't say go back to exactly the old text. No, 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 no. but yeah. the, the, literally the such as mutual TLS mm -hmm. instead of recommended. Yes. That's what I was saying. I will propose something for the next version. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I do want to just quickly give a shout out, like the, thank you to the people who've worked on this issue and been looking into this. This is this is a hard problem, um, and the working group, you know, a lot of people have done a lot of good work here, so um, that is appreciated. Daniel, is is this your last slide, or is it? You have more. Um, actually, that's my last slide. Um, so there were the comments today, and there were also some very, very good comments by Aaron on the list um, on some uh, things where we should expand a bit. But I think apart from that, we are in a good state. So do you want to discuss any of those issues that was raised by Aaron, or is that something that you want to continue on the mailing list? Um, I think that's fine on the list unless Aaron wants to chime in here. I'm happy for that to just keep going on the list. Um, to save time here. Okay. Anybody else has any comments, questions? Okay. And so do you, uh, Daniel, do you see any kind of major issues with those comments so far or can we, are we, like, you, will you be able to address those comments quickly so we could kind of start the process of uh, pushing this to the ISG? I think, um, I believe um, the team prob or the, the group is probably ready to push that forward. Is, is that, and anybody has a comment about that after we address those comments that, that we discussed today and on the mailing list? I don't think there is anything major at this what time, I've right? seen so far, it's, it's really minor things, and I can address them, say, tomorrow or something, and upload a new version. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody kind of objects to kind of moving this forward after after we kind of after Daniel and Tim update the, the draft? Is any major concerns be, beyond that? So, th will there be another like working group last call, like opportunity to review the changes or? Um... So so yeah, like it, we we could we could do a a short uh, work group last call because I I'm assuming that the changes are not major, uh, but but yeah, we could we could do that. If... I mean, I I think it would be good to give the working group at least you know like a couple days to just digest the changes since we we've seen a lot of kind of nuanced edits on this like uh, on this document, um, and you know, it'd be good to make sure that we're landing in the right right place on some of these issues. Okay, fair enough. Hi, this is Roman. I mean, I would endorse a, a, a quick working group last call, a second call, just to make sure everyone's good with this before we proceed. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, perfect. Good. Any any other comments? We still have a few minutes here for for this uh, this part of the meeting. Any Any other comments, questions, suggestions? Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, hey, Aaron, are you, can you share from your side? I should be able to. Yes. Does that look okay on your end? Yes, we can see that. Yeah. So um, OAuth for browser-based apps. This is a um, this is a draft that includes recommendations for people building browser-based apps using OAuth to specifically um, apps that are executing in a browser, also known as single-page apps. 
Um, the idea is this complements the OAuth for native apps uh, recommendations for the specific things that are unique to a browser-based environment. The uh, summary of the things that are in this draft um, are that it, it currently says apps must use uh, the auth code flow with Pixie. In other words, must not use the implicit flow and must protect against CSRF attacks, which gives a few options, um, either ensuring that authorization server supports Pixie or using the state parameter or the OpenID Connect nonce parameter if the app is also using OpenID Connect. Um, this includes exact redirect URI matching uh, from the authorization server, and there are the same recommendations on refresh tokens that are in the security BCP which is that re refresh tokens must either be rotated or have a maximum lifetime or idle timeout. Um, most of this is done by actually just referencing the security PCP um, in the document itself. So this is sort of the current state of things, um, changes since the last time we met um, at IETF 106. Um, Mike Jones sent a, a large chunk of feedback, which had a lot of good, um, good, good points in it. So all the editorial changes and most of the substantive changes from Mike has now been incorporated into this. Um, this also now disallows the password grant even for first party applications, which matches the security BCP and uh, refresh tokens are now allowed as long as they conform to the security BCP previously. Uh, in the previous draft, they were not allowed. Uh, there's also a handful of other editorial clarifications that I've made uh, since then as well. So that's sort of the current state of things. Um, there's several now open questions um, based on the changes to the security BCP since this has been changed. So the security BCP has been updated to uh, actually relax the requirement of Pixie. It's now no longer required. It is only recommended. And that now brings up the point of, well, this should probably match it. Um, and the conditions under which Pixie is not actually required are kind of uh, complex. So I am thinking that we should sort of delegate that to the security BCP um, rather than try to reference them here. Um, and then in Mike, um, in Mike's email, a lot of this is actually coming from Mike Jones' review, uh, which was based on the changes after the security BCP has been updated. So um, some of the open questions that I have not incorporated from uh, Mike's email, because they require further discussion here, are things like this. Um, right now, there are, there are very few references to OpenE Connect in this document at all. Um, if we are going to add references to it, then I would want to be specific about things like which response types or response modes are actually useful to protect against these attacks that it is helping with. Um, and there's one other point, which is that in the in the secure in this uh, browser-based app BCP, there's a section that describes an attack, well, a situation where the authorization server doesn't actually uh, can't actually be sure that the access token was received by the right application, which is what Pixie solves. Um, but any form of issuing access tokens in the authorization response does not actually solve that problem. So I'm struggling with how to reconcile that against allowing something like an OpenE Connect response mode that issues access tokens in the authorization response, even if it prevents things like access token injection. So. Um, these are some things to talk about. There's um, also a handful of uh, things in Mike's email where he specifically requests a discussion uh, by the group. And um, these are some things that are, I would say, not necessarily unique to browser-based environments, but uh, probably more common in browser-based environments. Um, so first one, um, there is very little guidance uh, in general about how to how applications can vary a redirect URL um, without 
relying on storing things in cookies, which can often get too large to be useful in browsers. So things like how how do you actually use the state parameter safely in this situation to vary the redirect URL? Um, that's probably something that should go into this document as well. Um, and then there was another point of can a signed request URI be used as an alternative to exact redirect URI matching, um, which I think that would also affect the security BCP as well. Um, if that if that was something we were interested in exploring. And then um, there's this third point about refresh tokens in browser-based apps now that they are allowed here and or almost in fact recommended. Um, in a browser environment, there's very little reason for a browser app to have offline access and uh, refresh tokens are often used for offline access. So can we provide any recommendations here to uh, prevent the risk of sort of refresh tokens hanging around where they could be used by, um, you know, by public, because these are public clients, they can, they can be used without a client secret. So they are sort of at a higher risk. So can we provide any recommendations for how to handle these refresh tokens in this sort of higher risk environment? Um, and a couple of things came to mind around that either recommending that refresh tokens like explicitly recommending that refresh tokens be revoked at the AS when the user signs out there. Or um, I've been seeing this idea of online access as a new scope to complement offline access. Um, and I believe there that is used in some extensions elsewhere and uh, some implementations. So that's something else to think about um, bringing into this. Um, last thing that I want to bring up before we open this up for discussion. There is a, uh, this demo app was brought to my attention where it's someone who actually implemented a OAuth client in a service worker in a browser, which is a specific API that's uh, very sort of isolated from the main part of the, the browser environment, the JavaScript environment in the browser. And what this effectively does is it means that a browser can actually protect access tokens and refresh tokens from being accessed by anything else on the page, which is turns out very useful for browser-based apps, especially because they are uh, not able to use client secrets effectively. And uh, essentially what this does is it routes, it turns this little service worker into an OAuth client where every API request has to run through it. So it means that tokens can't be extracted by random JavaScript on the page. So uh, I saw this, and this seems like a valid pattern that is has a lot of benefits in this environment. And I'm wondering if we should add this now as a an additional architectural pattern to the document. So that was a lot of stuff. Um, that's the current state of things. I'm happy to go back on into these slides, and um, would like to uh, yeah open this up for discussion. Hi, this is. So remember to state your name, please, uh, when you speak. Go ahead, uh, Mike. Sorry. Hi, this is Mike Jones. Aaron, thank you for addressing most of the review comments from me and the Microsoft developers. As I think you've already partly alluded to, the one substantive comment, which is really important in my view, that has not been addressed and that makes it unaligned with the security BCP is you're requiring Pixie across the board in your current text, whereas if you read the uh, security BCP in 453, there's two countermeasures that you can use for code injection. You can either use Pixie or OpenID Connect nonce. And even if, you know, we decide, okay, we'll use code flow for browser-based apps, Pixie isn't needed if you're using the OpenID Connect nonce correctly, and we'd be doing a disservice to people requiring breaking changes when they're not technically necessary and not aligned with the BCP. So I would request that you make it clear that it's either Pixie or the OpenID Connect nonce, but not both. So this was one of the things where I'm 
uh, I feel like saying, uh, it, like, I feel like the text needs to be more explicit because just saying use OpenID Connect nonce does not actually make it clear how that solves how that solves the attack because it requires a few more steps on top of that. So um, if we do add that, I want to make it explicit about all of the steps required in order to actually use that instead of Pixie. Sure, that's fine. So for instance, you could describe using the C hash value in the ID token to confirm that the code hasn't been injected. And you know, other similar things where you're just repeating the steps that are already required when you're using the nonce correctly. Um, and I'd be happy to work with you on that, but you know, I think you said you were going to send another message about the rest of the stuff, and I don't think that happened. No, I've been buried and haven't responded to you either. But for the record, I think that's the major change that must be made before we take this document any further. Um, Lars is speaking here. Um, I, you were just talking about nuns versus pixie. You are, you are, now you are bringing up the C hash. That's from my perspective the third option so so what's your intention i mean the security pcp intentionally only mentions nuns and uh pixie since they both go very well with code um c has requires another response mode so what, what's the scope of the of the change that you're also proposing for the bcp well the the simplest change is with the security bcp where for instance in the security BCP 4.5.3 countermeasures, it gives two alternatives, one being Pixie, one being nonce. And I'm fine with the scope going only that far of the changes. I was responding to Aaron's suggestion that he wanted things to be really explicit and lay everything out. And you know, if you do want to be that explicit, C hash is one of the things that you might want to be explicit about. But that wasn't my ask. I thought Aaron was going there. My ask is to make it clear that Pixie's not required. Okay, so the option would be to 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 instead refer to the um the text in the in the security PCP. I mean it's it's a separate section. Or a lot and refer to it. I mean I get wanting to refer and not repeat stuff, but there's also a tension that developers tend not to follow references. They want the package solution in one place. So if the browser-based apps doc can at least summarize things in a way that's actionable by developers, but is aligned and not different than the security BCP, I think that's fine too. What if yeah, that, say, that's. Yeah, or just delete all the stuff about Pixie from the browser based apps thing and just refer to the security BCP. What about that? I'm, do major, I'm, sorry. You, you either, I'm not quite done. You either do, need to do the major surgery and remove all the recommendations and just have references or at least align them. What about Backman, Amazon? Um, I, I definitely think we want to bring these into alignment. Um, I agree with Mike's concern that developers don't necessarily want to follow references. I think there's room for us to say that this um, this risk will be mitigated. Uh, and two ways that you can do that are Pixie or if OpenID Connect nonce as described in the BCP and point I point developers there for further details. I don't think we want to try and replicate all of the the the, the explanation that the BCP has. Um, I think that's just going to be a recipe for you know, trying to constantly trying to tra chase uh, this draft and future drafts. So um, that would be my suggestion. Uh, Daniel Fett, um, I'd like to highlight that we are talking about a problem that cannot really appear in public clients. So code injection is an attack that you need when you have a confidential client. And as far as I understand, we're here talking about only SPA, so public clients, right? 
necessarily. Well, that's what we said before, yeah, some, somewhere on the slides. This is Mike. You can use dynamic client registration yeah. in a native app or in a browser-based app to get a client secret dynamically, which you can safely store. Whether you still consider that a public client or a confidential client, I think is semantics. Uh, but the semantics are meaningful here because very explicitly it is now a confidential client. So at that point, is at your instances of the client would likely have different client IDs, uh, unless you were doing something really funky, yeah. uh, so, which would make code injection you know, yeah. non-trivial. That's, that's right, yeah. Thorsten speaking, uh, what I would like to point out, and I pointed it out several times in the course of the discussion, uh, I don't think that all SPAs will be public clients. Um, as you all may have noticed, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of um, using SPAs in conjunction with a backend, especially for use cases where you really, really need to have a, a real confidential client that you can identify as a business partner. So what I would like to get across, and that's, for example, for us, very important. Uh, so what I would like to get across, uh, so SPAs can be for, um, uh, confidential clients as well. So we shouldn't restrict the discussion of SPAs uh, that are public clients. Uh, this is Justin, but Torsten, I would argue that in that case, the SPA is not actually the client at all. It is the back end that is the OAuth client, from the OAuth perspective. And that is a pattern that is uh, covered by this BCP because telling people not to do OAuth directly in their app is just as valuable as telling them how to do OAuth. But that does not make the SPA itself a confidential client. It makes it part of a larger system, which includes a confidential client, which it calls as an API, for example. I think back to the initial discussion around the, the, the scope of that, of that um, a BCP, and from my perspective, an SPA is one that uses a front end it has code that lives in the user agent uh, without any any uh, further assumptions regarding the rest of the architecture. I mean, we can go back to that, to that discussion, but I, it seems I, I've got a different uh, picture on that. I would ask, what's the, if, if we're not focusing this document on uh, single page apps where we are actually doing the OAuth flow from the browser, you know, user agent side code. Doesn't doesn't that just mean we're talking about all web clients? Then that doesn't really seem like the, the right scope for this document. I don't know. I think I think um, you're you're right because I think there is no clear delegation between an SPA and well another web application. I, I think for the purposes of OAuth, the delineation is really where is the OAuth flow happening? Is it happening through user agent side code or is it happening through server side code? That's a, a meaningful distinction to make. The document itself actually notes that. Um, I, I, I think that's that's the right delineation for us to be using here. Uh, that what what we're considering browser-based apps for the purposes of this doc are really, and maybe the name is, is, isn't is quite descriptive enough there, but what we're really focusing on is apps where the, uh, the, the OAuth client logic resides in user agent side code. Aaron, does that, does that kind of match your understanding yeah that does much the intent here and the document calls out the case of uh javascript code talking to a backend so that um that architecture is pointed out and sort of the the, the goal there is that um in that case that is uh that javascript code is not an oauth client and the rest of this document does not apply to that architecture The that's the goal there right so the idea is that if you do have a confidential client in the back end that is doing the OAuth flow itself that is something that falls under the regular OAuth recommendations 
And I guess the next guidance is, if you don't, but you could have that, do that. <laughs> right. Right. So what we're talking about are either public clients or dynamically registered confidential clients. Yes. Where the client is running in user agent code. I would still argue that code injection is not a problem in specifically these cases, but um, yeah, we should talk about that on list maybe. So, uh, on this particular case in which uh, there is a backend, currently the document says something uh, uh, that is a bit odd the fact that uh, uh, you can use the access token. Uh, in the browser as identifier of a session. And the, to me, that looks a bit odd. Let's say that uh, if we use the cookie, then we just fall back on the regular uh, uh, web app with a backend. But as soon as you say that you want to use uh, an artifact, which is not dealt with uh, by the browser directly, but you have to deal in code, it looks like there is a large deal of security recommendations that we should have in there. And another point is that. Uh, if you see in the wild, a lot of people are uh, recommending also this scenario in which uh, the backend obtains tokens and then forwards them to the JavaScript, and the JavaScript oh. uses them directly for calling APIs, which I find uh, dangerous without uh, any further guidance, because now at this point, uh, your uh, backend will actually effectively behave like an authorization server, but without having uh, all the guidance that normally we would give in there. So I'm wondering if we could be on one side, just summarize, sorry for the long uh, uh, intervention. On one side, uh, summarize better what we mean by using the access token as a pointer to the session. And the other is uh, perhaps explicitly address the scenario in which uh, the backend is used uh, as a facade. And maybe even just saying uh, it's out of scope, but at least uh, just acknowledging the, its existence. I think that's a great point, and that probably is worth writing something about in here because that is something people are doing. Um, so we should either tell people how to do it safely or not to do it for whatever reason. Um, so I'm, I like that idea. We can talk about that further. Um, let's try to bring it up on the list though to save time here because I think that's a pretty big topic, but I do like the idea of mentioning that. So, so Vittorio, would you be able to send that? into the list, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in this, in the specific case of this question here of um, Pixie or the nonce parameter, um, I still want to spell out the exact scenarios where it's OK to do it, even if we just sort of say, go read Open Connect to actually figure out how. Um, just to be clear, are we still talking about using just the authorization code flow? Uh, or does this also, uh, so Mike, are we talking about using the nonce parameter and getting an ID token using the authorization code flow or also using the response type token to get the ID token? The response type token isn't legal. Um, ID token token is legal. Um, Sorry, I meant ID is, token. There's six response types that are legal, at, at a minimum, I think you want those that um, include the word code um, to be legal because those are the ones that return the access token from the token endpoint. So, so can we you know, code say token, here code that token, if you want to rule out the, the two implicit ones, ID token and ID token token, uh, you know, we can have that discussion and I get it, but don't rule out the ones that return the code on the back end. Or that return okay, so the access the, token on the back end. Yeah. So, person speaking, we should be very careful not to include those that issue tokens in the front channel. That's what I just said. Yes. Yeah, I, I know. I know. I just wanted to, to emphasize that that from my perspective, code ID token um, would be uh, one of the reasonable options, alternative options, because the ID token then can be used to to protect the code um, from from injection. I think that's what you wanted to. Yeah. Thank you. 
about Backman. Uh, is this just something where we need to be clearer that when we're saying code is is required, that we're talking about code as one uh, potentially one response uh, type in a multiple response type request? where rather than trying to enumerate the, the possible combinations of code with something else, you know, the, the, the purpose here is that we, we need to make sure the refresh token access token are being sent over the token, the token uh, endpoint. Uh, and you do that by making sure code is the re response type. There might be other response types and they might be fine, but you know, we just don't include token and must include code. Um, you know, there's only eight response types in the registry, and I think we'll do develop more of a favor by being explicit which of those eight makes sense um, and which don't. It's not a large set. I don't see it expanding. So, for instance, none is safe, but uh, doesn't do anything. Um, token is unsafe. ID token token is unsafe or ID token code is safe. We can just list which of the eight are good and bad. This is Justin, but it's not just a matter of which is good and bad. They are good and bad under different circumstances. So token is perfectly fine if you're using Pixie. It's not the token on its own, uh, or sorry, code uh, own on its own is perfectly fine if you're using Pixie. It's not that uh, it's necessarily good always, it's good under specific circumstances. Um, so while I, I think it makes sense to have some guidance along that, um, I'm actually with, uh, with Annabelle in saying that we really need to uh, instead say why each of those bits, not necessarily each of those bits, but why a particular thing works in a particular way. So, for example, say, you know, you have to get your access token from the token endpoint. To do that, you know, you must include authorization code. Uh, if you are protecting it using an OpenID Connect ID token as specified over here, then you also have to include, um, you know, one of the ID token bits in your response. Um, and I think that that is better guidance to developers than either a strict enumeration of what's in the registry, because as we all know, registries don't stay static forever. I think it's foolhardy to pretend it would. Um, that's why we have a registry after all. And, um, and two, it's going to help developers that might find themselves in some weird combination a legacy system that they have to support to figure out where they actually need to go um, and you know figure out like what bits they need to add and why we can't assume that people are doing things just based on what's in that list i of course agree with justin that saying why is critical um all i was saying is i think we also want to say what uh to the best of our ability I definitely think there's room for saying you know, what, and in, in terms of examples, um, you know, I, I really like Justin's, I feel like Justin more clearly stated than I that the need to, to get developers to understand why this is, these methods are good, those methods are bad. Um, I, I think if we do that, then we have a clearer path to presenting things like ID token and nonce as uh, other ways that you can protect um, the, the, the response. Um, and I, yeah, I absolutely agree, let's include those as, as examples because they are going to be relevant for a lot of developers. Um, and just to reiterate something else Justin said, there are also going to be developers out there who are having to roll some funky uh, proprietary response type potentially to accommodate legacy systems that they're dealing with um, that you know, will really benefit from a clearer statement of why this is important and why 
this option works for this case and that option works for that case. Um, it may be worth looking at you know, the text that comes out of this discussion and seeing if, if it would be better served to, to move that to the BCP, um, that, the, the security BCP. Mr. Jennings, are we kind of, are we saying it needs to be an exhaustive list or are we saying like these are the codes that we recommend in, and then here's some scenarios that we recommend, but they're not ex, um, exhaustive or exclusive. So what I'm hearing is we should add text that says uh, these, these applications must get tokens, access tokens from the token endpoint. And to protect that process, you have to either use Pixie or use OpenD Connect and check the nonce value. And then in addition to that, we can include what um, the sort of summary of what Anibal was saying, which is that um, the, the response type um, must not include token, which is a way to ensure that you're getting tokens from the token endpoint. And then list examples of here are the common scenarios. Using the authorization, using the code response type with Pixie, using code plus ID token response type, and we can list out a few of them that are likely to be uh, common. I, I, th I think you can consolidate those to be just like one thing. Like you need to get the token over the token from from the token endpoint, and that means you need to include the code response type. Um, to protect that, uh, you can use Pixie. Or you can use you. You may be able to use an alternative such as nonce if you are using a combination response type uh, from OpenID Connect, like code ID token. Yeah. So sorry, guys. I, I need to call time here. So um, this is a great discussion, and I, I'd be happy to kind of extend it if we if people are are ready to extend that call, or we can continue and. I, Aaron, I think you have more open issues that you want to discuss. Is is that true? Right? Uh, yeah. However, I don't have time to extend the call right now. Um, but so, what I what I can do is um, write these in new threads on the list, and we can continue the discussions there. Uh, would would um, would another session for this topic help, or do you want to continue that on the mailing list? Why don't we start on the list, and maybe we okay. can tentatively plan for an additional session on this um, later, like after the rest of the topics that were sounds, that are on the agenda. Good. Sounds good. Yeah, let, let me know if, if, if yeah, that is then, but, yeah. Go ahead, Mike. I think Aaron knows a lot of things that he can do to the draft now. It would be fine to see another draft before we have another call. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. 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 Plus one to all of that. that. That sounds great. OK. Awesome. Then I think let's call it a day here. <laughs> That was a great discussion and thank you guys. Um, any last minute comment here? Great work, Aaron. Great work, uh, everybody who's been involved on these. Absolutely. And yeah, okay. This is important. So, talk to you next Monday. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.